So I wanted to uh, welcome everybody to this robe offering ceremony or katina as many uh, as we are used to hearing in uh, Buddhist countries. But first of all I thought I'd start with because we've taken the precepts and we've uh, chanted the uh, recollection of the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, it's very good to reflect that this is a very important part of the practice. This is how we can affect the world, our families, the society we live in and the world. This is actually our gift of peace, which I'll probably mention later. The practice is very important. And it's not that the Buddha imposed these like commandments on us. It's up, up to us whether we practice them up to us whether we use the precepts in our lives. If we don't use them, of course, we soon find that things get difficult when we break the five precepts, for sure. But so I thought I'd tell a story because there seems to be some waving there. Is it okay? Everything technical? <laughs> I can see some movement. All right. Oh, is that better? All right. Oh, well, that's nicer, isn't it? Better picture. Anyway. So I thought I'd tell a story. I'm well known for my stories by Nasruddin. Nasruddin is a Sufi teacher who is supposed to have lived in Turkey, I think about 1100, 1200 AD. And uh, he was uh, quite a character. He's a bit like a Zen person, actually. So this one is a story that you haven't heard, actually, but I like very much. And this, on this occasion, Nasruddin, who was uh, living in a village, who went to the capital, and when he came to the capital, at the gates of the capital, the king had made an edict that anyone who entered the city who told a lie would be executed, would be hung on the spot. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? <laughs> Could be. So Nasruddin arrived at the gate and the guard said that, you know, that anyone that tells a lie, they'll be hung. And uh, so Nasruddin took this on board and he said, to, he heard this, and as he entered the city, the, the guards asked him, well, uh, what business do you have in the city? And so Nasruddin said, I'm on my way to be hanged. <laughs> it was a lie. <laughs> it was a lie. But the guards realised that guards didn't believe him at all. They said, but if they hung him, it would be true. <laughs> so they couldn't hang him for telling a lie, even though it was a lie. So this makes an important people, a point. You can't, you can't force people to keep rules, can't force people to keep laws. And the only real, the practice is what we do individually and the truth that we come to. The king can't, ordain, uh, can't tell us what the truth is. The Buddha can't tell us what the truth is. He can point it out to us, of course. We'll find out for ourselves by practice. So this is the important thing. So... As you go into the city, don't get hang, hung. <laughs> but that's no rudin for you, isn't it? He's so, so good at thinking on your feet. <laughs> also taking a risk. <laughs> so I'd like to just uh, um, introduce the robe offering ceremony or katina ceremony. Um, and just to mention a few things about it. That, Of course, Yasmin, of course, has preempted me. She's given you the background. No, that's good. You can, can't say too much. So I will tend to give more of a, um, the feeling side of the experience. Because it's a very happy day. This is a very joyful day for people, particularly in Buddhist countries. Um, you know, in Sri Lanka, I see it in Thailand, and presumably in Burma too. And it's a very, you know, if you can offer the katina robe, and this today, um, the katina robe will be offered uh, to myself and to Ira Paker for um, different, not for ours, for us, but on behalf of the Sangha. But for them, you know, uh, for uh, Chinta and Indira will offer to the nuns and Chinta will offer to the monks. But in uh, Sri Lanka particularly, it's, an, it's, it's a, uh, a thing that people love to do. They really, it's, it's a highlight in their lives. And uh, sometimes they go to a lot of effort and an incredible expense to do it. It's that important for people. Not only from the point of view of merit, I think merit we call punya or pin in Sinhala, but just, just uh, the incredible joy they can get from it, happiness. And this really was brought home to me last year when I went to a katina at a... Uh, uh, went to a katina ceremony at a Dutch, Dutch monk's kuti or hut in the forest, a long way from Colombo, the main city. 
And uh, the uh, people who had organized the katina were offering the katina robe and organizing everything for it, had come the day before to the village where the kuti was nearby. And they'd got up very early and organized everything. They'd set up everything going around the kuti for the, uh, for the katina. And on the day, they had a perihera, a parade or procession to the, to the kuti. And in due course, they offered the robe. And I, I looked over and saw the man offering the robe. He was offering the katina in memory of his, her, his mother, who had passed away that year, who was a very, uh, you say, devout Buddhist, very devout Buddhist. And I could see tears in his eyes, and they were tears of joy. It was just so lovely to see. And I really, you know, when you see that, you realize how this goes to the heart, particularly for traditional Buddhists, you know, how deep it goes. And what an honor, too. It's a great honor. And uh, so this is a very, very uh, significant thing for the lay community in particular. Having said that, in Sri Lanka, there are some monasteries that don't have katinas. <laughs> Anyone know one that doesn't have a katina? Famous one, actually. Oh. The one that uh, I'm thinking of, or there's two actually I'm thinking of, I mentioned, is Mitri Gala. Do you know Mitri Gala? Nisarinawani, it's called. The same as my name, actually. Very famous monastery. Where? Who's, who lives there? People know? Who is the chief monk? Local harm to him. Damajiva, Venerable Damajiva is the local Hamdru, and he comes here. But they don't have a, um, a katina. And the main reason is because it's quite a disruption to the meditation practice. So that from early on, from about 1970, I think they had one katina, and that was it. <laughs> Never again. But they have a very much a dedication to the practice, you know, meditation, and not, not that sort of having ceremonies and so on. But of course, you know, it's of great benefit to the lay community and gives such encouragement to the lay community. Also, where I stay in Sri Lanka, a place called Tanjantana, I live in a cave on the side of a mountain, and it belongs to a group of monks that live on their own. So it sounds like a contradiction. And uh, we don't have a katina either, for very much the same reason. But we, as you notice, you will have noticed, we call this a look on the... Uh, the slide up here, the screen up here, it's robe offering ceremony. And why, we, why, why do we call this a robe offering ceremony and not a katina? People know? Yeah. Yes, that's very good. It's very good. I think most of the uh, um, you know, traditional Buddhists will know. For the, it, the robe offering ceremony or the katina, you need... Uh, um, which marks the end of the vasa, the three-month rains retreat. And so after that period, then we have the one month of offering robes. Katina is katina season, we call it, is for one month. So monasteries, different monasteries, will have it at different times in, during that month. And um, uh, so there's in, an, in traditional Buddhist countries, you might go to three or four <laughs> or more katinas. But the reason uh, we uh, don't call it a, a uh, katina is because we first of all we have the certain conditions before it can become, become a katina. And as people were mentioning, you need the right number of monks or the right number of nuns. In Thailand, for instance, the tradition is you must have five monks who have lived in that monastery before you qualify. In Sri Lanka, you must have five monks at the ceremony one of whom has at least has been staying in that place. So that's another approach. And in the vineyard, that seems quite, uh, quite okay too, actually. So that is one of the main reasons this is not a uh, katina, a ceremony. But nevertheless, it functions very much like that. And one of the things that uh, I think is very important, because you will hear a lot of people who come from non-traditional uh, Buddhist countries, maybe from the West and so on, um, we'll, we'll say, say uh, things like, what's the use of ceremonies? What's the use of ceremonies? Because that's what, that does come up in people's minds. And, uh, uh, you know, like with the idea, couldn't the resources, the money and energy be used in a better way, you know, for, for poor people, for health issues, you know, for supporting health facility, uh, uh, facilities and so on. Interestingly enough, two weeks ago, a Sri Lankan person said this to me. You know, because they were talking 
uh, talking about uh, some of the, in Sri Lanka they have some of these huge, we call them pincamas, these ceremonies for making merit. Pincama means making merit. And in Sri Lanka they can be huge, like one or two million people can be at these. This is looking, this is big time. And um, you know, they go to say to the main uh, stupa, the Ruinweli Saya, and uh, you know, they'll be decorated with lights on the outside. You know, there will be, as I say, two million people, 100,000 people around the base, I think you can fit, and sometimes even helicopters dropping flowers. So this person was saying, you know, couldn't, could, wouldn't it be better? Would it be better to use the resources that are spent on, on some of these big occasions for, for other purposes? And so that, that was something that I, I, um, I thought, well, yeah, it's interesting, you know, to, to reflect on that because that's something that many people may think, you know, why these big ceremonies, what's the point, and so on. I'd like to reflect that we, we would never, would anybody say that about the uh, MCG or the football? <laughs> would they say that about that? Or even the racing or uh, gambling, you know, Crown Casino and all this sort of thing. So uh, it's interesting to reflect on that. But uh, so we spend a lot on things that, in a sense, I would ask, you know, about those things. Uh, do they really nourish people's well-being, or are they just a distraction, a diversion? Of course, footy fans will say, "No way! It's a religion." <laughs> They'll say, "It's a religion." <laughs> but, but that's the point, point one could take on board. You know, when you think of it in perspective of these religious ceremonies that are, that are uh, such a, um, a big event. But with everything in Buddhism, it always comes back to, what does it come back to? I think the Buddhist, most people will know this. What does nearly every action we do, whether through body, speech or mind, what does it rely on? Intention, exactly. So it just depends on what our intention is when we do these these big um, ceremonies, what our intention is. And if it's coming from a positive, wholesome intention, then of course this is a good thing to do. If it's coming from a negative intention, an unwholesome intention, then it's not so, not, not beneficial in the long run. But what we can see, particularly with these big ceremonies, is the result you know, for many people, what would be the result, say, if at this one of these big ceremonies for a, with a million or two million people? What do you think people will feel? This is what I'm looking at, the results. I hope they would feel this. I do. <laughs> joy, yes, exactly. There's a lot, of, a lot of joy, happiness at some of these big ceremonies, you know, incredible amount of uh, inspiration too, you know, that develops from doing, ha having, participating in these big ceremonies. So this is an important part of it, that it actually brings up this joy and this happiness. And this is, what is joy and happiness useful for? This sort of uh, ceremony, even this sort of ceremony is useful for, is for developing faith or confidence. And faith is, uh, a very, very important foundational controlling spiritual faculty, the Buddha mentioned it, is called sadha or uh, shradhawa in, in Sinhala. And faith is like confidence, it's like trust, and it's also valuing, thinking something is worthwhile. And it's very important for us, you know, the word faith in English sounds a bit, uh, it, it's got the Christian connotation, but of course in Buddhism it's always faith based on wisdom. It's not blind faith. Um, so this faith is incredibly important for us in daily life, whatever we undertake, this confidence, this valuing, because we see something is valuable, worthwhile, then we'll undertake the practice that's associated with it. We'll develop energy, virya, and this is what we need in order to practice whatever religion we're practicing, whatever we do in life. If we don't believe what we're doing, say for a job, for instance, is worthwhile, if we don't have any faith in it, the energy won't be there. But if you believe, yeah, this is a good thing, then you'll go for it. And I see this, I've been recently at a, uh, last month actually, at a forum on meaningful ageing uh, Meaningful Aging Australia organised it and it was called High Quality Spiritual Care in Aged Care 
And the thing I was impressed with was the passion of these people. The commitment was incredible. So this is a faith or confidence giving rise to energy in their, in their lives. And it's very important for us as Buddhists because then we will undertake, possibly, you know, we'll undertake dana and sharing, giving. Uh, this is part, very important part of the practice, sharing, giving. Uh, is, is generosity, developing generosity, and the Buddha emphasizes that a lot. Uh, so this is a very important way of uh, bringing happiness to us, basically. Because when we give, we can have this joy and this happiness. And it also reduces the sense of, who do we usually think about? Most people think about, nearly everyone. Number one, <laughs> me, what I want, what I, what I don't want, what I like, what I don't like. But when we give, we're thinking of the other person. So in a way, it helps reduce that natural focus, the natural uh, selfishness, as it were. Oh, my goodness. I just realised. Good to... Oh, no, I've got a few more minutes. Not long, actually. Yes. So... Uh, I... I've got a lot longer talk here. I've got another Nasrudin story too. I just thought, oh, oh dear. Seven minutes. <laughs> Seven minutes. All right. Got to move it. <laughs> so not only does it give us the energy to practice the uh, ethic, uh, the uh, dana, it also encourages, gives us the energy, the commitment to practice ethical conduct. This is sila. And as I mentioned before, this is a real <laughs> contribution to everyone we live with and the whole community and the world. This is actually a commitment to world peace. And then the next thing it does give us energy for too is when we have this faith. And it gives us uh, the energy to undertake meditation and mental cultivation. This is cultivating the mind. What's cultivating the mind? Developing the positive. Well, first of all, avoiding and letting go of the negative, the unwholesome, and de developing and maintaining the positive. So simple in, to say, a lot harder to do. <laughs> but that's the essence of the practice. And of course, very important part of this is meditation. So the, the aspects of mental development the Buddha focused on in particular in the meditative sense is first of all mindfulness of course, so we know what we're doing, we can be mindful to keep the precepts and we can be aware of what's happening in the present moment. And from that to develop uh, this stillness or steadiness of mind, this is called samadhi. And of course with samadhi, what can we develop from samadhi? When the mind is peaceful and still and can look deeply into things, we have the potential for developing wisdom. And this is the whole point of the Buddha's path. And sometimes people say, well, what is wisdom? And I just say, that the Buddha, it sounds very, often it sounds very grand. You know, people want to talk about Abhidharma or Paticca Samapada. This is dependent arising. But the, at the most important level, Wisdom is knowing good from bad, wholesome from unwholesome. And this may sound basic too, but it's, if it were that basic, the world wouldn't be like it is, actually. And so other aspects, of course, of wisdom we, we develop a right view. And this is the, the view particularly of karma and rebirth, karma and rebirth is very important, central to it. And the fact that there are enlightened beings in the world and the, the, uh, that who have seen the truth, have seen this world and the other world. And of course the other aspect and very important aspect of right view is the Four Noble Truths, that uh, this is um, unsatisfactory, this is the cause of unsatisfactoriness and this is the ending or sensation of unsatisfactoriness and the path leading to the ending of unsatisfactoriness or suffering. So this is a very, uh, this is a central uh, teaching of the Buddha. And in reality, we talked about it, Adrian was talking about it this morning, it's what motivates people. When we have uh, dukkha, we call it, we have difficulties, when we have uh, suffering in our lives, we really are motivated to do something about it. The rest of the time, Cruise control, <laughs> cruise control. But we get off our seats and do something when we've got dukkha. It's a really, it's a great motivator. Terrible that we have to wait until then, isn't it? But it's the truth. Uh, it gets us going. And the other aspect of right view, and we can see it, is the nature of reality. 
And the nature of the reality is that everything is impermanent, transient, nothing lasts, that's anicca. That everything has the nature of, uh, and then there's also the element of dukkha, that there is un unsatisfactoriness uh, and uh, suffering, um, all, all those aspects. The good thing about dukkha is because of anicca, because of impermanence, there's no permanent dukkha. The problem with our lives is we want permanent happiness, permanent sukha, something that will last, that will always be there, and we can't get it. And this leads to actually our dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, as we call it. And then, of course, because of impermanence, where do we hang the sense of me, who I am, a permanent sense of uh, I'm always like this? We realise because of impermanence, there's nowhere that we have a permanent uh, permanent self. And I was talking to a person yesterday who has had a stroke. And I said to her, you know, what's your, you know, in, in terms of a Nietzsche, in terms of yourself, the self you had last year before the stroke, very different from the self you're experiencing now. And she said, yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's very difficult once you've had a stroke and you're in that situation to live with that. But if you have the wisdom that this is all part of uh, reality, that is part of nothing lasts, that's impermanence, transience, that, that helps. As Ajahn Chah said, it's like a spillway in a dam. If a dam doesn't have a spillway where the, um, the excess water can flow off, it'll go over the wall and push the wall down, perhaps. It'll destroy the dam. And that's like when we you know, have some suffering in our life, our partner's died, a child's died, or we've lost a job, or we've lost everything in terms of our... Uh, our possessions and so on. If we don't know that this is part of impermanence, if we don't take it on board, at least in our minds, that nothing lasts, our dam will break and we'll be swept away with it. But if we have this spillway of knowledge, understanding, yep, this is the nature of reality. It's still painful. Obviously it will still be painful, but we can bear it and uh, it will make it a lot easier for us to cope with. So now I'm very close to the time to finish, so I, only got, I haven't got really halfway through my talk yet. <laughs> so I'm going to finish with a Nazarudin story. <laughs> a good place to finish, actually. So yeah, I think you'll like this one. I haven't told this one either, actually, before, so this is good. That's a nice thing. I don't speak as much as Ajahn Brahm, so I don't have to repeat myself as much. <laughs> so one day, Nazarudin was in his village and uh, the travelling teacher came and they were having this uh, religious discussion or debate. I think they were trying to outdo each other actually. And this teacher said to Nazarudin, I am so detached, I never think of myself, only of others. Great. <laughs> well, Nazarudin thought, what can I say? <laughs> Nazarudin said, I am so detached, I see myself as if I were someone else. He said, so I can afford to think about myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's not rude, he's very tricky. <laughs> but I thought he probably won the point, actually. <laughs> it's actually quite funny. So I think we can, I was going to mention a lot more about the, uh, the importance or the benefits of the, uh, the offering of the robe, the robe offering. Of course, that it's good karma, we know that. I'll just mention it brief, briefly. Very importantly, that it's support for the Sangha, material support, but it's also um, spiritual support too. And I liken this to you know people who go to a, a, a football game, a cricket game, and they support their team. It's very, very good. It gives The obvious reason for people going to support these things, apart from enjoying it, is they give energy to their players. We're the players. <laughs> And so it's so lovely. <laughs> You're the players too, actually, to be honest. <laughs> but it's so lovely to see so many players, as it were. Because this year for Vasa, there were 11 monastics in total. Uh, two here, myself and Ajahn Katapunyu, and eight nuns at uh, Newbury uh, Monastery, and one monk. So that adds up to 11, I hope. So that's pretty good. But it also strengthens, this, this uh, ceremony strengthens our sense of community, as a community coming together, very important. And I'm very pleased for the people who are watching this live streaming because 
this is an opportunity for them to participate too, and particularly for the elderly or the disabled, for whatever reason. Um, it's very, very useful. They can have that sense of connection with the community, taking part in this katina. I don't know which camera I'm looking at. This one, actually. <laughs> yeah, I've got the wrong camera. And also, it's also an opportunity just to, uh, to ask forgiveness. We do forgiveness as before we offer the robe. There's a short forgiveness ceremony. For really, in a sense, the katina or the robe offering ceremony is like the new year for the monks and the nuns, for the sangha, the beginning of the new year. So we, offer, we the lay community asks forgiveness and we, ask, uh, we accept that and ask for forgiveness in our turn. And very important thing just to mention about the, the robe offering ceremony, almost said katina, <laughs> is that the big value of it, big emphasis is harmony in the sangha. We work together if we're making a robe, which is a traditional way. And there's also often it brings harmony in the lay community. There's always differences of opinions, but it brings, people have to work together. So this is very valuable. And I'd like to particularly mention uh, the work of the committee and uh, the committee members to make this possible, to make the Buddhist society possible. They do a lot. And that is an incredible gift they give to all of us, not only to the lay community, to the, to the Sangha, the monks and the nuns as well. So sadhu for that. So they were sadhu, they're very good. So I think, I think with that, I'm a little over time and we can go, I, do I do the clicker? Let's see the clicker. Oh, yeah. oh here it is. Let's see what's, oh, all oh, right, it's already changed to that. First, yes. yes. Back, it's back there. coming. And now there will be. Does Yasmin want to announce this? All right. So now is going to be the offering of flowers and candles by the students of the Dhamma School. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Very good. <laughs>